So these are the equations that we derived last time. So these are the equations perpendicular to V infinity, and these are parallel to V infinity. So these are the general equations for flight, it includes acceleration and the curving flight. So now we're gonna specialize these to level flight, which means that the pitch angle is zero. So the airplane is going straight across the horizon. So it's not pitched up. The flight path is not pitched up. Unaccelerated flight, which means the velocity does not change. And the flight path is not curved. So the radius of curvature is infinity. So that means flying level across the horizon, not speeding up and not turning in any way. So this is really what would be called the cruise flight condition. So that's what you do after you take off, you climb to altitude, and then you're going to California and you just maintain the same altitude, same airspeed, and you don't turn. So let's do, look at the equations and see what happens when we make these assumptions. So up to these equations, theta is zero. So the sine goes away. And theta is zero, so the cosine becomes one. Unaccelerated, so that's zero. The radius of curvature is infinity, so that's zero. And we're gonna make one more assumption. We're gonna say that the thrust angle is zero, which means that the engines are lined up perfectly in line with uh, the airplane for cruise flight condition, which makes sense, because that would be the most efficient way to put the engines on the airplane. So then this is zero and this cosine is one. So what's left? This top equation turns into thrust equals drag, move the minus drag over to the other side and the bottom equation turned in, into lift and moved the weight over to the other side. Lift equals weight. Which you can get directly from drawing the airplane in this flight condition to start out with. The velocity vector is straight across, so the relative wind's like that. So the lift is perpendicular to V infinity, exactly counteracts the weight. And the drag is backward, because it's perpendicular to the lift or parallel to V infinity. And the thrust angle is 
pointed forward, so the thrust equals the drag. In terms of statics or dynamics, this is called static equilibrium because the sum of the forces is zero in each direction. So this is cruise or level unaccelerated flight. This, these are the equations that we'll use. We're not climbing, we're not accelerating, we're just flying along. And so we're gonna spend quite a bit of time with these equations talking about, well, how much thrust do I need at different air speeds? If I'm flying at 100 knots, how much thrust do I need? If I'm flying at 200 knots, how much thrust do I need? And this is the basic performance kind of calculations. It's the same kind of thing you would do in your car, is if you're gonna drive down the highway and you're gonna assume the road is level, how much engine power do you need to overcome the drag for your car? And that's gonna give you your MPG, your miles per gallon, right? All right, so hang on to these equations because we're gonna use these a lot here in a minute, but I wanna do another special case. So knock this stuff out. If you want to just rewrite these equations, I'm gonna cheat. So now we're gonna look at a different airplane, a vertical takeoff, vertical or short takeoff and landing airplane. And we're gonna look at it in hover. This is like the AV-8B or the Harrier, which I'll show you an X-plane in a minute. But what this airplane has is a set of nozzles that can direct the thrust directly downward. They can also direct it backward for normal flight, but it can hover because the engine thrust gets turned and pointed down. Oh, sorry, the, the airflow goes down like that, so the thrust vector is up. So this is airflow, exhaust. So it creates a thrust up. And so our free body diagram of this then means that the thrust balances the weight and nothing else happens. We're in hover. So the velocity, the forward velocity is zero. The airplane is just sitting there. So how do we take these equations and get that? We've drawn the picture, but these equations should apply. So there is no airspeed. So the drag is zero because it's not moving. And you're not getting air to any aerodynamic lift for the same reason. There's no air flowing over the wing. So those get knocked out. Right, and we're still saying, well, we're in level flight, although we're not flying, so theta is zero. So this is gone. And our thrust angle is straight down, so it's 90 degrees. Or the it's straight up. So that angle is 90 degrees. So this is zero. So that means that it's not accelerating forward, 
which fits the hover condition, right? We're not flying, lift and drag are all zero, there's no forces, we're in level flight, and the thrust is totally pointed up, so we don't speed up, makes sense. How about this, the cosine of this is one, and this is 90 degrees, so this is one, and we're not turning, so this is knocked out. So this says thrust equals weight. I think I got the sign on this wrong. Should be tilted up. Did I lose the sign here? Yeah, there's a minus sign there that I lost. So thrust equals weight. And so that's a perfectly valid steady state equilibrium flight condition. We're just not going anywhere. And the thrust is totally providing the necessary force to counteract the weight. Okay, let me see if I can make X plane go here. You saw a chat. No, I'm not seeing anything. You guys on Zoom can see this, right? Yes. yes. Great. Folder has disappeared. Where did it go? Oh, what am I thinking? I just need to scroll down. So the Harrier is in a folder called VTOL for vertical takeoff and landing. So it's under the main aircraft folder. Click in here. We're going to pull up the Royal Navy Sea Area Harrier. And here's what this airplane looks like. It's got a swept wing, vertical horizontal tail, big engines. And if we look in here, this thing right here is the nozzle that directs the thrust downward. We go back. Is it what? Yeah, and there's also ports out the nose and tail and at the wingtips that allow it to get control of the airplane. So there's thrust ports that come out of the front and the back and the wings as well. I'm gonna go back into the airplane and there's a lever here that controls the angle of that nozzle. And it's set at 90 degrees right now. If we push this up, you can see that that nozzle is now turned back. And in fact, I've got the thrust all the way up. So it's wanting to try to take off. 
I'm going to stop it. So let's put the nozzle back down. Pull the thrust down here. And the nozzle's back down. So let's crank the thrust back up. And I can do this with the F1 and F2 buttons. You see it trying to lift off? It's not going to make it because it's got all these missiles and bombs on it, and it's too heavy to do a vertical takeoff. So if it's fully loaded with fuel and fully armament, all it can do is go down the runway and take off, do a short takeoff at a slower speed than it normally would. So I grabbed this airplane and edited it in Plane Maker and created a light version. Doesn't mean it has less alcohol and less filling. It just means that I cranked the weight down. I took the bombs and missiles off and decreased the total weight. Nozzles are down. So if we increase the thrust, We're not getting my thrust to go up. No, I'm not. I'll tell you, the throttle is acting weird in this thing. And it will take off and hover in the air. And if I weren't having trouble with the throttle, I don't know what's going on with this installation because I got this to do it. You can try this at home. Edited an X-plane, reduce the gross weight to, the, to 19,000 pounds and take off. But this airplane is able to do a vertical takeoff. Let's try it one more time. I know what's going on. We actually have a throttle and a joystick here. Yeah, the throttle is connected to the PC. Where does that go? Here we go. This will be even better if it works. All right, let's go back to the airplane. So our throttle hooked up. All right, give me a minute. I'm going to shut X plane down. All right, we're seeing this again, right? Let's see if I have throttle control.
All right, maybe I, the axis, you can adjust what it does. So let's see if I got throttle control now. There we go. All right, so let's reset this. We can do a vertical takeoff. Let's get back inside. And we're hovering in midair with the airplane. Now this thing is notoriously bad, hard to fly. And I don't think I have my joystick set up 100% right. Let me fiddle with that for a minute. Pitch control, roll control, throttle. Then you can take off and hover, and then you can transition to forward flight by slowly moving the nozzles backward and flying forward. See if I can do this. I'm going to. And I've lost control of the airplane. But you can see that the airplane will hover. I need to get somebody in to set the joysticks back up because somebody disconnected the joysticks in here. So that's the Harrier or the AV-8B. And that's how that airplane performs in hover. So now I wanna jump back to the easy case with the level unaccelerated cruise flight condition here. And we're gonna spend some time on that. So we're going to add some new terminology. So when we're in that cruise flight condition, we're going to say that if those equations are satisfied, that the thrust is what's required to maintain that flight condition. So with the Harrier, that I was unsuccessful in flying for very long, it, if the thrust was up enough sufficient to counteract the weight, that's the thrust required to hover. Here we're talking about the thrust required to maintain level flight. And then our other equation is that the lift equals the weight. And we're gonna work from here, but an equation that I wanna look at real quick is divide the top equation by the bottom one. And then if we solve for the thrust required, we find out that it's equal to the weight divided by the lift divided by the drag, just from the equations of motion for the aircraft. And we can turn the lift and the drag into coefficients by multiplying and dividing by Q infinity S like that, right, they'll cancel out. And so you can also look at this as CL over CD. And the reason I wanna look at this is if we wanna find the minimum required thrust, 
which is what we'd want to do. We want to find out the minimum. This occurs at max CL over CD. And if you remember for the airfoils, we did an example where we calculated CL over CD and we found the maximum. And we said that was the efficiency of the airfoil. So it turns out it makes sense that the most efficient lift to drag ratio is tied with the minimum thrust. And it makes even more sense because the lift is the thing that we need to counteract the weight. So it's why we have the wing. And the drag is just a side effect that we get from the air flowing over the wing to generate the lift. So this is kind of good versus bad. So the lift to drag ratio is a measure of how much lift you get that you want versus the side effect of the drag. So it's a measure of the efficiency. Now what we want to do is plot the thrust required versus velocity. Because if we change velocity, we need different thrusts. Makes sense, right? If you want to go really fast, you're going to need more thrust. But it turns out if you want to go really slow, you need more thrust as well. We'll talk through that. But the goal here for performance is to figure out how at different speeds we need different thrust required. So we want to plot thrust required versus velocity. So what is the thrust required? Thrust required equals the drag. Okay, we're done, right? But how do you calculate drag? It comes from the drag coefficient, because we're going to calculate the drag from the airfoil and the profile drag and all that. And then what is the drag? This is the drag of the airplane. So let's put in that drag model that we talked about last time. Here's our drag model. Remember what it was? It was profile drag or CD0. And now there's a hat on the E because it's the whole airplane, not just the wing. And so the drag comes from just the parasitic drag and also the lift. So this thing here Now, let me multiply this out. So I want to work on this a bit. In fact, I want to multiply through by Q infinity S. And I want to plug in for CL. So from the other equation, lift equals weight. So this was the thrust equals drag equation from the lift equals weight equation. We find out that the lift coefficient, which is lift over Q infinity S, we stick in weight for this. And that's the CL that we have to fly at to stay in the air. So we use both equations, thrust required equals drag, lift equals weight, that goes into CL, which then goes into the drag equation. And let's write out what this turns out to be. All right, this multiplies that stuff. I just plugged in for the lift.
And so the velocity shows up here, but it also shows up here. So let's plug that in. Q infinity is one half rho V infinity squared. So I pulled the velocity out. And I put the velocity outside here as well. Aware what? Those, I forgot. Some books use Q bar for Q infinity. So, go back, what did we do? We said thrust requires equals drag. Drag is in terms of lift. Lift equals weight, so we calculate the lift and then we get this equation. This is the parasitic drag. And this is the induced drag due to lift, just like for the finite wing, but now we're talking about the whole airplane. So now let's go back to the original idea of how does changing the velocity change the total drag and the total thrust. So let's say we're at a low velocity. Which term is bigger? So velocity is a small number. So we got this stuff multiplied by a small number, right? Then we got this stuff multiplied by one over a small number. So this thing is gonna be big. And this is gonna be small. So the velocity is 10, right? So we get 10 squared is 100. And over there we got one over 100 squared, right? One over 100. But then we do a bigger velocity. Now we got 1,000 here squared and one over 1,000. So that number got smaller and this number got bigger. So depending upon how fast or how slow we're going, different parts of this equation make the thrust bigger or smaller. So if you're flying really slow, the parasitic drag is small because you don't have much airflow around the airplane. But you have to fly at a high angle of attack to get the weight lift, opposing the weight, and that makes the drag, induced drag, high. But if you're flying really fast, then you don't need much angle of attack to give you the lift. But the airflow is so fast around the airplane that you get a lot of parasitic drag. And if you plot this, thrust required versus velocity, there's a sweet spot that you can fly at where you get minimum, minimum thrust. So I need a spot to do that. Let me draw it over here. So if we plot thrust required versus velocity, it looks like this. So this is the low velocity area where the induced drag dominates. And this is the high velocity area where the parasitic drag dominates. And this minimum
is that point where CL over CD is a maximum. Because our other formula that we did for this said, well, that's got to be the minimum. That makes it lowest, and it's true that that spot turns out to be where CL over CD is max. So some, the point of maximum efficiency of our airplane. So this is just pictures and equations, but next we're gonna actually take an airplane and we're gonna plot thrust required versus velocity so I can show you that this really does happen. And it does happen because the equation we're gonna use is this, and those two different terms vary differently with respect to velocity. So throughout chapter six in the book, which is where we are now, he uses two different airplanes to, uh, as examples. And when you do homework on this, you'll be doing two different airplanes in the, in the homework set as examples. How am I doing on time? We've got a few minutes left. So the airplanes We'll have to wait till next time because they're on my other desktop and we're almost out of time anyway. In chapter six, he shows you these airplanes. So next time I'm gonna have you write some stuff in your book on the pages with the airplanes. So you might bring your book next time. In your textbook, the airplanes are described on page 455 and 456. Uh, one of them is a Cessna 182, so it's a propeller driven airplane. And the other one is a Citation 3, which is a jet airplane. And we'll use both of those in examples as we go through different types of performance calculations. Homework, you guys are working on another set posted to Blackboard. So that's work it by Friday. We'll go over it on Friday and then upload to Blackboard on Monday with a quiz. And these are all finite wing problems. I put a reminder on here that says, remember this is a finite wing. So don't do just straight airfoil stuff on these because it is a finite wing and you have to do those calculations. Any questions before I go?